Section 11 of The White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch. Section 11. The Cellars of Rueda. Part 1. I Enter the Cellars. It happened on a broiling afternoon in July 1812, and midway in a fortnight of exquisite weather, during which Wellington and Marmont faced each other across the Douro, before opening the beautiful series of evolutions, or rather of circumvolutions, which ended suddenly on the 22nd, and locked the two armies in the prettiest pitched battle I have lived to see. For the moment neither general desired a battle. Marmont, thrust back from Salamanca, had found a strong position where he could safely wait for reinforcements, and had indeed already collected near upon 40,000 of all arms, when, on the 8th, Bonny marched into camp from Asturias with another 6,000 infantry. He had sent, too, to borrow some divisions from Caffarelli's army of the north, but these he expected in vain, for Bonnet's withdrawal from Asturias had laid bare the whole line of French communication, and so frightened Caffarelli for the safety of his own districts that he at once recalled the 12,000 men he was moving down to the Douro, and in the end sent but a handful of cavalry, and that grudgingly. All this I had the honour to predict to Lord Wellington, just twelve hours before Bonnet's arrival on the scene. I staked my reputation that Caffarelli, on whom I had been watching and waiting for a month past, would not move, and Lord Wellington, on the spot, granted me the few days' rest I deserved, not so much in joy of the news, which nevertheless was gratifying, as because for the moment he had no work for me. The knot was tied. He could not attack except at great disadvantage, for the fords were deep, and Marmont held the one bridge at Tortesillas. His business was to hold on, covering Salamanca and the road back to Portugal, and await Marmont's first move. The French front stretched as a cord across an arc of the river, which here takes a long sweep to the south, and the British faced it around this arc, with their left, centre and right, upon three tributary streams, the Guerreña, Tarancos and Zapardiel, over which last, and just before it joins the Douro, towers the rock of Rueda, crowned with a ruinated castle. Upon this rock, for my quarters lay in face of it, on the opposite bank of the stream, I had been gazing for the best part of an idle afternoon. I was comfortable, my cigaritos lay within reach, my tent gave shade enough, and through the flapway I found myself watching a mighty pretty comedy, with the rock of Rueda for its back scene. A more satisfactory one I could not have wished, and I have something of a connoisseur's eye. To be sure, the triangular flapway narrowed the picture, and although the upstanding rock and castle fell admirably within the frame, it cut off an animated scene on the left, where their distant shouts and laughter told me that French and British were bathing together in the river below, and rallying each other on the battles yet to be fought. For during these weeks, and indeed through the operations which followed up to the moment of fighting, the armies behaved less like foes than like two teams before a cricket match, or two wrestlers who shake hands and afterwards grin amicably as they move in circles, seeking for a hitch. As I lay, however, the bathing place could only be brought into view by craning my neck beyond the tent door, and my posture was too well chosen to be shifted. Moreover, I had a more singular example of these amenities in face of me on the rock of Rueda itself. The cliff standing out against the sun's glare like ivory beneath the blue and quivering with heat was flecked here and there with small lilac shadows, and these shadows marked the entrances of the caves with which Rueda was honeycombed. I had once or twice resolved to visit these caves, for I had heard much of their renown, and even, although this I disbelieved, that they contained wine enough to intoxicate all the troops in the peninsula. Wine in abundance they certainly contained, and all the afternoon men singly and in clusters had been swarming in and out of these entrances, like flies about a honeypot. For whatever might be happening on the Travancos, under Lord Wellington's eye, here at Rueda, on the extreme right, Discipline for a while had disappeared, and presumably the like was true of Marmont's extreme left, holding the bridge of Tortesillas. 
for from the bridge a short roadway leads to Rueda, and among the figures moving about the rock, diminished by distance though they were, I counted quite a respectable proportion of Frenchmen. No one who loves his calling ever quite forgets it, and though no one could well have appeared, or indeed felt, lazier, I was really giving my eye practice in discriminating on this anthill the drunk from the sober, and even the moderately drunk from the incapable. There could be no doubt at any rate concerning one little Frenchman, whom two tall British grenadiers were guiding down the cliff towards the road, and against my will I had to drop my cigarette and laugh aloud, for the two guides were themselves unsteady, yet as desperately intent upon the job as though they handled a chest of treasure. Now they would prop him up and run him over a few yards of easy ground, and on, at a sharp descent, one would clamber down ahead and catch the burden his comrade lowered by the collar with a subsidiary grip upon belt or pantaloons. But to the Frenchman, all smooth and rugged came alike, his legs sprawled impartially, and once, having floundered on top of the leading Samaritan with a shock which rolled the pair to the very edge of a precipice, he recovered himself and sat up in an attitude which, at half a mile's distance, was eloquent of tipsy reproach. In short, when the procession had filed past the edge of my tent flap, I crawled out to watch, and then it occurred to me, as worth a lazy man's while, to cross the Thapadil by the pontoon bridge below and head these comedians off upon the high road. They promised to repay a closer view. So I did, gained the road, and, seating myself beside it, hailed them as they came. My friend, said I, to the leading grenadier, you are taking a deal of trouble with your prisoner. The grenadier stared at his comrade, and his comrade at him. As if by signal, they mopped their brows with their coat sleeves. The Frenchman sat down on the road without more ado. Prisoner? mumbled the first grenadier. Aye, said I. Who is he? He doesn't look like a general of brigade. Devil take me if I know. Who will he be, Bill? Bill stared at the Frenchman blankly, and rooted him out of the dust with his toe. I wonder now. Picked him up somewheres. Get up, you little pig, and carry your liquor like a gentleman. It was Mike introduced him. I did not, said Mike. Very well, then, you did not. I must have come by him some other way. It was yourself tripped over him in the cellar, up yander. He broke off and eyed me, meditating a sudden thought. It seems mighty queer, that. Speaking of a cellar as up yander, now a cellar by rights should be in the ground, under your foot. And so it is, argued Bill. Slap in the bowels of it. Ah, be quiet with your bowels. As I was saying, sir, Bill tipped over the little fellow and the next I knew he was crying to be took home to camp, and Bill swearing to do it if it cost him his stripes. And that is where I come into this fatigue job, for the man's no friend of mine, and will not be looking for it, I hope. Did I so? Bill exclaimed, regarding himself suddenly from outside, as it were, and not without admiration. Did I promise that? Well, then, he fixed a sternly disapproving stare on the Frenchman. The Lord knows what possessed me, but to the bridge edge you go if I fight the whole of Clausel's division single-handed. Take his feet, Mike. I'm a man of my word. Yep, ready, is it? Forward. For a minute or so, as they staggered down the road, I stared after them, and then upon an impulse mounted the track by which they had descended. It was easy enough, for they had never come down alive, but the sun's rays smote hotly off the face of the rock, and at one point I narrowly missed being brained by a stone dislodged by some drunkard above me. Already, however, the stream of tipplers had begun to set back towards the camp, and my main difficulty was to steer against it, avoiding disputes as to the rule of the road. I had no intention of climbing to the castle. My whim was, and herein again I set my training a test, to walk straight to the particular opening from which, across the Thapardil, I had seen my comedians emerge. I found it, not without difficulty, a broad archway of rock, so low that a man of ordinary stature must stoop to pass beneath it, with, for threshold, a sill of dry, fine earth, which sloped up to a ridge immediately beneath the archway, and on the inner side dipped down into darkness so abruptly that, as I mounted on the outer side, I found myself staring, at a distance of two yards or less, into the face of an old man, seated within the cave, out of which his head and shoulders arose into view as if by magic. Ah, said he calmly, good evening, senor. You will find good entertainment within. He pointed past him into absolute night, 
or so it seemed to my dazzled eyes. He spoke in Spanish, which is my native tongue, although not my ancestral one, and as I crouched past the archway, I found time to speculate on his business in this cavern, for clearly he had not come hither to drink, and as clearly he had nothing to do with either army. At first glance I took him for a priest, but his bands, if he wore them, were hidden beneath a dark poncho, fitting tightly about his throat, and his bald head baffled any search for a tonsure. Although a small book lay open on his lap, I had interrupted no reading, for when I came upon him, his spectacles were perched high over his brows, and gleamed upon me like a duplicate pair of eyes. He was patently sober, too, which perhaps came as the greatest shock of all to me, after meeting so many on my path who were patently the reverse. I answered his salutation. But you will pardon me, excellent sir, for saying that you perhaps mistake the entertainment I seek. We gentlemen of Spain are temperate livers, and I will confess that curiosity alone has brought me, or, say rather, the fame of your wonderful cellars of Rueda. I put it thus, thinking he might perhaps be some official of the caves, or of the castle above. But he let the shot pass. His lean hands from the first had been fumbling with his poncho, to throw back the folds of it in courtesy to a stranger. But this seemed no easy matter, and at a sign from me he desisted. I can promise you, he answered, nothing more amusing than the group with which you paused to converse just now by the road. Eh? You saw me? I was watching from the path outside, for I too can enjoy a timely laugh. No one, I am bound to say, would have guessed it. With his long scrag neck and great moons of spectacles, which he had now drawn down, the better to study me, he suggested an absurd combination of the vulture and the owl. Dios, you have good eyes then. For long distances, but they cannot see Salamanca. His gaze wandered for a moment to the entrance beyond which, far below and away, a sunny landscape twinkled, and he sighed. But before I could read any meaning in the words or the sigh, his spectacles were turned upon me again. You are Spanish? he asked abruptly. Of Castile, for that matter. Though not, I may own to you, of pure descent. I come from Aranjuez, where a Scottish ancestor, whose name I bear, settled and married soon after the War of Succession. A Scot. He leaned forward, and his hands, which had been resting on his lap, clutched the book nervously. Of the Highlands? I nodded, wondering at his agitation. Even so, senor. They say that all Scotsmen in Spain know one another. Tell me, my son. He was a priest then, after all. Tell me, for the love of God, if you know where to find a certain Manuel MacNeill, who I hear is a famous scout. That, reverend father, is not always easy, as the French would tell you. But for me here, it happens to be very easy indeed, seeing that I am the unworthy sinner you condescend to compliment. You? He drew back, incredulous. You? he repeated, thrusting the book into his pocket and groping on the rocky soil beside him. The finger of God, then, is in this. What have I done with my candle? Ah, here it is. Oblige me by holding it. So, while I strike a light. I heard the rattle of a tinder box. They sell these candles. Here he caught a spark and blew. They sell these candles at the castle above. The quality is indifferent and the price excessive. But I wander at night and pick up those which the soldiers drop. An astonishing number, I can assure you. See, it is lit. He stretched out a hand and took the candle from me. Be careful of your footsteps, for the floor is rough. But pardon me, before I follow, I have a right to know upon what business. He turned and peered at me, holding the candle high. You are suspicious, he said, almost querulously. It goes with my trade. I take you to one who will be joyful to see you. Will that suffice, my son? Your description, reverend father, would include many persons, from the Duke of Ragusa downwards, whom, nevertheless, I have no desire to meet. Well, I will tell you, though I was planning it for a happy surprise. This person is a kinsman of yours, a Captain Alan MacNeill. I stepped back a pace and eyed him. Then, said I, your story will certainly not suffice for I know it to be impossible. It was only last April that I took leave of Captain Alan MacNeill on the road to Bayonne, and close to the frontier. He was then a prisoner under escort, with a letter from Marmont 
ordering the governor of Bayonne to clap him in irons and forward him to Paris, where, the marshal hinted, no harm would be done by shooting him. Then he must have escaped. Pardon me, that again is impossible, for I should add that he was under some kind of parole. A prisoner under escort, in irons, condemned or at least intended to be shot, and all the while under parole? My friend, that must surely have been a strange kind of parole. It was, and saving your reverence, a cursed, dirty kind. But it sufficed for my kinsman, as I know to my cost, for with the help of the partidas I rescued him, close to the frontier, and he, like the fool or like the noble gentleman he was, declined his salvation, released the escort, which we had overpowered, shook hands with us, and rode forward to his death. A brave story. You would say so, did you know the whole of it. There is no man alive whose hand I could grasp as proudly as I grasped his at the last, and no other, alive or dead, of whom I could say with the same conviction that he made me at once think worse of myself and better of human nature. He seems then to have a mania for improving his fellow men. For, said my guide, still pausing with a candle aloft and twinkling on his spectacles, I assure you he has been trying to make a Lutheran of me. Wholly incredulous as I was, this took me fairly between wind and water. Did he, I stammered, did he happen to mention the scarlet woman? Several times, though in justice to his delicacy, I must say it only in his delirium. His delirium? He has been ill, almost desperately ill. A case of sunstroke, I believe. Do I understand that you believe sufficiently to follow me? I cannot say that I believe, yet, if it be not Captain Alan MacNeill, and if for some purpose which, to be frank with you, I cannot guess, I am being walked into a trap, you may take credit to yourself that it has been well, nay, excellently, invented. I pay you that compliment beforehand, and for my kinsman's sake, or for the sake of his memory, I accept the risk. There is no risk, answered the Reverend Father, at once leading the way. None. That is to say, with me to guide you. There is risk, then, in some degree? We skirt a labyrinth, he answered quietly. You will have observed, of course, that no one has passed us, or disturbed our talk. To be sure, the archway under which you found me is one of the false entrances, as they are called, of Rueda cellars. There are a dozen between this and the summit, and perhaps half a dozen below, which give easy access to the wine vaults and in any of which a crowd of goers and comers would have incommoded us. For the soldiers would sing, and very wisely, I must allow, to follow a chart and confine themselves to the easier outskirts of these caves, wisely because the few cellars they visit contain Val de Peñas, enough to keep two armies drunk, until either Wellington enters Madrid or Marmont recaptures Salamanca, but they are not adventurous, and the few who dare, though no doubt they penetrate to better wine, are not in the end to be envied. Now this passage of ours is popularly, but quite erroneously, supposed to lead nowhere, and is therefore by consent avoided. Excuse me, said I, but it was precisely by this exit that I saw emerge three men as honestly drunk as any three I have met in my life. For the moment he seemed to pay no heed, but stooped and held the candle low before his feet. The path, you perceive, here shelves downwards, by following it, we should find ourselves, after ten minutes or so, at the end of a cul-de-sac. But see this narrow ledge to the right. Pay particular heed to your footsteps here, I pray you. It curves to the right, broadening ever so little before it disappears around the corner. Yet here lies the true path, and you shall presently own it an excellent one. He sprang forward like a goat, and, turning, again held the candle low, that I might plant my feet wisely. Sure enough, just around the corner, the ledge widened at once, and we passed into a new gallery. Ah, you were talking of those three drunkards. Well, they must have emerged by following this very path. Impossible. Excuse me, but for a scout whose fame is acknowledged, you seem fond of a word which Bonaparte, we are told, has banished from the dictionaries. Ask yourself now. They were assuredly drunk and your own eyes have assured you there is no wine between us and daylight. My son, I have inhabited Troeda long enough to acquire a faith in miracles, even had I brought none with me. 
along this ledge our three drunkards strolled like children out of the very womb of earth they will never know what they escaped should the knowledge ever come to them it ought to turn their hair grey then and there children and drunkards said i you know the byword and might believe it but for much evidence on the other side but i was following another thought and for the moment did not hear him closely i suppose then the owners guard the main entrances but leave such as this for instance to be defended by their own difficulty why should any be guarded he asked pausing to untie a second candle from the bunch he had suspended from his belt eh surely to leave all this wine exposed in a world of thieves the reverend father smiled as he lit the new candle from the stump of his old one no doubt the wine growers did not contemplate a visit from two armies and such very thirsty ones the peasants hereabouts are abstemious and the few thieves count for no more than flies for the rest he was stooping again with his candle all but level with the ledge and a few inches wide of it held so it cast a feeble ray into the black void below us and down there thirty feet down perhaps as his talk broke in two like a snapped guitar string my eyes caught a blur of scarlet for god's sake i cried hold the light steady to what purpose he asked grimly that is one whom providence did not lead out to light see he is broken to pieces you can tell from the way he lies and dead too my son the caves of rueda protect themselves he shuffled to the end of the ledge and there at the entrance of a dark gallery so low that her heads almost knocked against the rock roof he halted again and leaned his ear against the wall on the right sometimes when the wall is thin i have heard them crying and beating on it with their fists i shivered the reader knows me by this time for a man of fair courage but the bravest man on earth may be caught off his own ground and i do not mind confessing that here was a situation for which a stout parentage and a pretty severe training had somehow failed to provide in short as my guide pushed forward i followed in not need terror i wanted to run i told myself that if this indeed were a trap and he should turn and rush upon me i was as a child at his mercy and he might do worse he might blow out the light and disappear as the gallery narrowed and at the same time contracted in height so that at length we were crawling on hands and knees this insanity grew two or three times i felt for my knife with an impulse to drive it through his back seize the candles and escape nor at this moment can i say what restrained me at length and after crawling for at least two hundred yards without any warning he stood erect and this was the worst moment of all for as he did so the light vanished or so nearly as to leave but the feeblest glimmer the reason being and i discovered it with a sob that he stood in an ample vaulted chamber while i was yet beneath the roof of the tunnel the first thing i saw on emerging beside him was the belly of a great wine tun curving out above my head its recurve hidden lost somewhere in upper darkness and the first thing i heard was the whip of a bat's wing by the candle my guide beat it off better take a candle and light it for mine these creatures breed here in thousands hear them now above us but what is that other sound i asked and together we moved towards it three enormous tons stood in the chamber and we halted by the base of the farthest where with a spilt pail beside him lay a british sergeant of the thirty-sixth regiment tranquilly snoring that and no other was the sound and a blesseder i never heard i could have kicked the fellow awake for the mere pleasure of shaking hands with him my guide moved on but we're not going to leave him here oh as for that his sleep is good for hours to come if you choose we can pick him up on our return so we left him and now i went forward with a heart strangely comforted although on leaving the great cellar i knew myself hopelessly lost hitherto i might have turned and fortune abiding have found daylight but beyond the cellar the galleries ramified by the score and we walked so rapidly and chose between them with such apparent lack of method that i lost count my one consolation was the memory of a burly figure in scarlet supine beneath a wine tun 
I was thinking of him when, at the end of a passage, to me indistinguishable from any of the dozen or so we had already followed, my guide put out a hand, and, drawing aside a goatskin curtain, revealed a small chamber with a lamp hanging from the roof, and under the lamp a bed of straw, and upon the bed an emaciated man, propped and holding a book. His eyes were on the entrance, for he had heard our footsteps, and almost we broke into one cry of joy. It was indeed my kinsman, Captain McNeill. End of part one. Section 12 of The White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales by Sir Arthur Quiller Couch. Section 12. The Cellars of Rueda. Part 2. Captain McNeill's Adventures. But how on earth came you here? was the unspoken question in the eyes of both of us, and each reading the reflection of his own, we both broke out together into a laugh, though my kinsman's was all but inaudible, and after it he lay back on his pillow, an old knapsack, and panted. My story must needs be the shorter, said I, so let us have it over and get it out of the way. I come from watching Caffarelli in the north, and for the last four days have been taking a holiday, and twiddling my fingers in camp here, just across the Sapardil. Happening this afternoon to stroll to this amazing rock, I fell in with the reverend father here, and most incautiously told him my name, since which he has been leading me a dance, which may or may not have turned my hair grey. The reverend father? echoed Captain Allen. He has not, said I, turning upon my guide, who stood apart with a baffling smile, as yet done me the honour to reciprocate my weak confidences. Captain Allen, too, stared at him. Are you a priest, sir? he demanded. He was answered by a bow. You didn't know it, cried I. It's the one thing he has allowed me to discover. But I understood that you were a scholar, sir. The two callings are not incompatible, I hope. Of the University of Salamanca. A doctor, too. My memory is yet weak, but surely I had it from your own lips that you were a doctor. Of moral philosophy, the old man answered with another bow. Of the College of the Conception, now, alas, destroyed. The care with which you have tended me, sir, has helped my mistake, and now my gratitude for it must help my apologies. I fear I have from time to time allowed my tongue to take many liberties with your profession. You have, to be sure, been somewhat hard with us. My prejudice is an honest one, sir. Of that there can be no possible doubt, but it must frequently have pained you. Not the least in the world, the old doctor assured him, almost with bonhomie. Besides, you are suffering from sunstroke. My kinsman eyed him, and I could have laughed to watch it, that gaze betrayed a faint expiring hope that after all his diatribes against the scarlet woman had shaken the doctor, upon whom, I need scarcely say, they had produced about as much effect as upon the rock of Rueda itself. And I think that, though regretfully, he must at length have realised this, for he sank back on the pillow again with a gentle weariness in every line of his Don Quixote face. Ah, yes, from sunstroke. My cousin, here he turned towards me, this gentleman, or, as I must now learn to call him, this most reverend doctor of philosophy, Gil Gonsalveth de Covadonga, found me some days ago stretched unconscious beside the high road to Tordesillas, and in two ways has saved my life. First, by conveying me to this hiding place, for the whole terrain was occupied by my month's troops, and I lay there in my scarlet tunic, a windfall for the first French patrol that might pass and secondly, by nursing me through delirium back to health of mind and strength of body. The latter has yet to come, Senor Capitano, the doctor interposed, and I. My cousin, your distaste for disguise will yet be the death of you. But tell me, what were you doing in this neighbourhood? Why, watching Marmont, to be sure, as my orders were. Your orders? You don't mean to tell me that Lord Wellington knows of your return. I reported myself to him, on the 19th of last month, 
in the camp on San Cristobal. He gave me my directions that same evening. But heavens, I cried, it is barely a week ago that I returned from the north and had an hour's interview with him, and he never mentioned your name, though aware, as he must be, that no news in the world could give me more joy. Is that so, cousin? He gazed at me earnestly and wistfully, as I thought. You know it is so, I answered, turning my face away, that he might not see my emotion. And as for Lord Wellington's silence, Captain Allen went on, after musing a while, he has a great capacity for it, as you know, and perhaps he has persuaded himself that we work better apart. Our later performances in and around Sabugal might well excuse that belief. But now I suppose you have some message for him? Is it urgent? Or will you satisfy me first how you came here? you whom I left a prisoner on the road to Bayonne, and, as I desperately thought, to execution. There is no message, for I broke down before my work had well recommenced, and Wellington knows of my illness and my whereabouts, so there is no urgency. He glanced at the doctor, and so did I. The Reverend Father's behaviour assuredly suggested urgency, I said. And was there none? asked the old man quietly. You sons of war chase the oldest of human illusions. To you nothing is of moment but the impact of brutal forces or the earthly cunning which arrays and moves them. To me all this is less hateful than contemptible, in moment not comparable with the joy of a single human soul. Believe me, my sons, although the French have destroyed my peerless university, Fortis Salamantina, Arc Sapientia, I were less eager to hurry God's avenging hand on them than to bring together two souls which in the pure joy of meeting soar for a moment together, and fraternising forget this world. Nay, deny it not, for I saw it standing by. Least of all be ashamed of it. I am not sure that I understand you, Holy Father, I answered, but you have done us a true service, and shall be rewarded by a confession, from a stubborn heretic too. I glanced at Captain Allen mischievously. My kinsman put up a hand in protest. Oh, I will prepare the way for you, said I, and by and by you will be astonished to find how easy it comes. I turned to the doctor, Gonsalves. You must know then, my father, that the captain and I, though we follow the same business, and with degrees of success we are too amiable to dispute about, yet employ very different methods. He, for instance, scorns disguises, while I pride myself upon mine. And by the way, as a professor of moral philosophy, you are doubtless used to deciding questions of casuistry, for twenty years more or less I have presided at the public disputations in the Sala de Clostro of our university. Then perhaps you will resolve me the moral difference between hiding in a truss of hay and hiding under a wig, for in faith I can see none. That is a matter for the private conscience, broke in Captain Allen. Pardon me, suggested the doctor. You promised me a narrative, I believe. We'll proceed then. Our methods, this at least is important, were different, which made it the more distressing that the similarity of our names confused us in our enemies' minds, who grossly mistook us for one and the same person, which not only humiliated us as artists, but ended in positive inconvenience. At Sabugal, in April last, after a bewildering comedy of errors, the Duke of Ragusa captured my kinsman here, and held him to account for some escapade of mine, of which, as a matter of fact, he had no knowledge whatever. You follow me? The doctor nodded gravely. Well, Marmont showed no vindictiveness, but said in effect, You have done, sir, much damage to our arms, and without stretching a point, I might have you hanged for a spy. I shall, however, treat you leniently, and send you to France into safe keeping, merely exacting your promise that you will not consent to be released by any of the partidas on the journey through Spain. My cousin might have answered that he had never done an hour's scouting in his life, save in the uniform of a British officer, and nothing whatever to deserve the death of a spy. Suspecting, however, that I might be mixed up in the business, he gave his parole, and set out for the frontier under the guard of a young cavalry officer and one trooper. Meanwhile, I had word of his capture, and knowing nothing of this parole, I posted to Lord Wellington, obtained a bond for 12,000 francs, payable for my kinsman's rescue, sought out the guerrilla chief, Mina, borrowed two men on Wellington's bond, the scoundrel would lend no more, and actually brought off the rescue at Biasain, a few miles on this side of the frontier. One of our shots broke the young officer's sword arm. The trooper was pitched from his horse and stunned, 
and behold my kinsman in our hands safe and sound it was then reverend father that i first heard of his parole he informed me of it and while thanking me for my succour refused to accept it very well done say you as a doctor of morality but meanwhile i was searching the young officer and finding a letter upon him from the duke of ragusa broke the seal not so well done say you but again wait a moment this letter was addressed to the governor of bayonne and gave orders that captain macneill as a spy and a dangerous man should be forwarded to paris in irons there was also a hint that a request for his execution might accompany him to paris and this was a prisoner who on promise of clemency had given his parole now what in your opinion was a fair course for our friend here on proof of this dirty treachery we'll reserve this as question number two answered the doctor gravely and proceed with the narrative which i opine goes on to say that captain macneill preferred his oath to the excuse for considering it annulled collected his escort shook hands with you and went forward to his fate a man must save his soul captain macneill explained modestly you are to me sir a heretic pardon my saying it which prevents me from taking as cheerful a view as i could wish concerning your soul but assuredly you saved your honour well i hope so the captain answered picking up the story but really in the sequel i had to take some decisions which obvious as they seemed at the time have since caused me grave searchings of heart and upon which i shall be grateful for your opinion am i appealed to as a priest most certainly not but as a professor a title for which by the way we have in scotland an extraordinary reverence i rode on sir with my escort and that night we reached tolosa where the young lieutenant his name was gerard found a surgeon to set his bone he suffered considerable pain yet insisted next morning upon proceeding with me i imagined his motives to have been mixed but pleased myself with thinking that a latent desire to serve me made one of them on the other hand the seal of marmont's letter had been broken in his keeping a serious matter for a young officer and one which he would naturally desire to defer explaining at tolosa he accounted for his wounds by some tale of brigands and a chance shot at long range on the morrow we rode to iran and crossed the bidasoa we were now on french soil throughout the morning he had spoken little and i too had preferred my own thoughts but now as we broke our fast and cracked a bottle together at the first tavern on the french shore i opened fire by asking him if he yet carried the marshal's letter with the broken seal to be sure said he and what will you do with it i went on why deliver it i suppose to the governor of bayonne to whom it is addressed and when asked to account for the broken seal you will tell him the exact truth about it and the rescue i must he answered and i hope my report will help you sir it will not be my fault if it does not you are an excellent fellow said i but it will help me little you do not know the contents of that letter as i do not willingly but because it was read aloud in my presence by the man who opened it and before he could remonstrate i had told him its purport now sir that was not quite fair to the young man and i am not sure that it was strictly honourable captain macneill paused with a question in his voice proceed sir said the doctor i reserve this as question number three remarking only that the young man owed you something for having saved his life just so and that is where the unfairness came in he was inexpressibly shocked why he cried the marshal had put you under parole so far as the frontier said i the promise upon which i swore was that i would not consent to be released by the partidas on my journey through spain once in france i could not escape his vengeance now for this very reason i have a right to interpret my promise strictly and i consider that during the past half hour my parole has expired i cannot deny it he allowed and took a pace or two up and down the room then halted in front of me you would suggest sir that since this letter was taken from me by the partidas and you and i alone know that it was restored i owe you the favour of suppressing it good heavens my young friend i exclaimed i suggest nothing of the sort i may ask you to risk for my sake a professional ambition which is very dear to you but certainly not to imperil your young soul by a falsehood no sir 
if you will deliver me to the governor of Bayonne as a prisoner on honourable parole, which I will renew here and extend to the gates of that city only, and will then request an interview for the purpose of delivering your letter and explaining how the seal came to be broken with Jolly, this was the trooper, for witness, you will gain me all the time I hope to need. That will be little enough, objected he. I must make the most of it, said I, and we must manage to time our arrival for the evening, when the governor will either be supping or at the theatre, that the delay, if possible, may be of his creating. I owe you more than this, said the ingenuous youth, and I, sir, am even ashamed of myself for asking so much, I answered. Well, so we contrived it, entered Bayonne at nightfall, presented ourselves at the citadel, and were, to our inexpressible joy, received by the deputy governor, who heard the lieutenant's report, and endorsed the false paper of Barreau, which Marmont had given me, and which, in fact, had now expired. The fatal letter Lieutenant Gerard kept in his pocket, while demanding an interview with the governor himself. This, he was told, could not be granted until the morning. The governor was entertaining that night, and with a well-feigned reluctance, he saluted and withdrew. Outside the deputy door we parted without a word, and at the citadel gate, having shown my pass, which left me free to seek lodgings in the city, I halted, and under the sentry's nose dropped a note into the governor's letter-box. I had written it at Undai, and addressed it to the Duke of Ragusa, and it ran, Monsieur le Marchal, I send this under cover of the governor from the city of Bayonne, out of which I hope to escape tonight, having come so far in obedience to my word, which appears to be more sacred than that of a marshal of France. My escort having been overpowered between Vittoria and Tolosa, I declined the rescue offered me, but not before your letter to the governor had been broken open and its contents read in my presence. This letter also I saw restored to its bearer, who during its perusal lay unconscious of a severe and painful wound in his sword arm. I beg to assure you that he has behaved in all respects as a gentleman of courage and honour, and conceiving that you owe me some reparation, I shall rely on you that his prospects as a soldier are not in any way compromised by the miscarriage of your benevolent plans concerning me. I laughed aloud, and even the doctor relaxed his features. Bravo, kinsman, said I. If Marmont hates one thing more than another, it's to see his majestic image diminished in the looking-glass. But faith, I'd have kept that letter in my pocket until I was many miles south of Bayonne. South? You don't suppose I had any intention of escaping towards the Pyrenees? Why, my dear fellow, that's the very direction in which they were bound to search. Oh, very well, said I, a trifle nettled, I will confess. Perhaps you preferred Paris. Precisely, was the cool answer. I preferred Paris. And having but an hour or two to spare before the hotels closed, I at once inquired at the chief hotels if any French officer were starting that night for the capital. The first named, if I remember, the Hôtel de Sud, I drew blank. At the second, the Trois Couronnes, I was informed that a chaise and four had been ordered by no less a man than General Soham and would start that night, as soon as he returned from supping with the governor. I waited. The general arrived a few minutes before ten o'clock. I introduced myself. General Soham, I groaned. Reverend Father, I have not yet tasted the wine of Rueda. It appears to me that the fumes are strong enough. He tells me that he introduced himself to General Soham. And I assure you found him excellent company. We travelled three in the chaise. The general, his aide-de-camp, and your fortunate kinsman. A second chaise followed with the general's baggage. He and the aide-de-camp at times beguiled the road with a game of piquet. For myself, I disapprove of cards. Doubtless you told them so at an early stage, I suggested, with a last effort at irony. I was obliged to, seeing that the general challenged me to a parti, but I did not, I hope, adopt a tone inconsistent with good fellowship. We travelled through to Paris, with a few hours' break at Orléans, an opportunity which I seized to purchase a suit of clothes more congruous than my uniform with the part I had to play in Paris. I had ventured to ask General Soham's advice, and he assured me that a British officer, though a prisoner on parole, might incur some risk from the Parisian mob by wearing his uniform in public. Cousin, said I, henceforth pursue your tale without interruption. There was a time when in my folly I presumed to criticise your methods. 
I apologize. On leaving the tailor's shop, I was accosted by a wretched creature who had seen me alight from the chaise in his majesty's uniform, and had followed, but did not venture to introduce himself until I emerged in a less compromising garb. He was, it appeared, a British agent, and a traitor to his own country, and I gathered that a part of his dirty trade lay in assisting British prisoners to break their parole. He assumed that I travelled on parole, and insinuated that I might have occasion to break it, and with all the will in the world to crack his head, I let the mistake and suspicion pass. For at Napoleon I received the address of a Parisian agent in the Rue Carcassonne, whose name I will confide in you, in case you should ever require his services. For truly, although I had some difficulty in persuading him that I broke no faith in seeking to escape from France, a point in which self-respect obliged me to insist, though he himself treated it with irritating nonchalance, this agent proved a zealous fellow, and served me well. He fell in, too, with my proposals, complimented me on their boldness, and advanced me money to further them. I took a lodging au troisième in the Faubourg saint honore and for a fortnight walked Paris without an attempt at concealment, frequenting the cafés and spending my evenings at the theatre. Once or twice I encountered Soham himself, with whom I had parted on the friendliest terms, but he did not choose to recognise me. Perhaps he had his good-natured suspicions. I lived unchallenged, though walking all the while on a razor's edge. I had reckoned on two fair chances in my favour. There was a chance that the governor of Bayonne, on finding himself tricked, would for his own security suppress Marmont's letter, trusting that the affair would pass without inquiry. And there was the further chance that Marmont himself, on receipt of my notes, would remember the magnanimity which, to do him justice, he usually has at call, and give orders whistling off the pursuit. At any rate, I spent a fortnight in Paris, and no man questioned or troubled me. On the same morning that I paid my second weekly bill, the agent called on me with a capital plan of escape, which, being a facetious fellow, he announced as follows. I wish you good morning, Mr. Buck, he began. Sir, I answered, I have no claim to such a designation. My pleasures in Paris have been entirely respectable, and I dislike familiarity. Mr. Jonathan Buck, I should have said. Sir, I corrected him, if your clients are so numerous that you confuse their names, I must remind you that mine is McNeil. Pardon me, he replied, you have this morning inherited that of an American citizen who died suddenly last evening in an obscure lodging near the Barriere de Pantin, and in addition, a passport now waiting for him at the Foreign Office, if you have the courage to claim it. You resemble the deceased sufficiently to answer a passport's description, and if you secure it, I advise a speedy departure, with not for you your objective. Accordingly, that same evening I left Paris for the Loire. You had the coolness to apply for that passport? And the good fortune to obtain it. If anything, my dear fellow, deserves the degree of astonishment your face expresses, it should rather be my consenting to use disguise, and so breaking through a self-denying ordinance, on which you have sometimes rallied me. Suspense, the danger from Bayonne hourly anticipated, had perhaps shaken my nerves. To be brief, I travelled to Nantes as Mr. Jonathan Buck, and in that name took passage in a vessel bound for Philadelphia, and on the point, as I understood, of lifting anchor. I slept that night on board the Minnie Dwight, this was the vessel's name, in full hope that my troubles were at an end. But next morning her captain came to me with a long face, and a report that some hitch had occurred between him and the port authorities over his clearing papers. And how long will this detain us? I asked cutting short an explanation too technical for my understanding. He answered that he had been to his consul to protest, but could promise nothing short of a week's delay. Well, I saw nothing for it but to shut the cabin door, make a clean breast of my fears, and desire him to help me in devising some new plan. He was a good fellow, and ingenious too, for after he had dashed up my hopes with the news that a similar embargo lay on all foreign ships in the port, his face cleared, and said he, there's no help for it, but you must play the sea lawyer, and I the brutal tyrant. It's hard, too, upon a man who treats his crew like his own children, and victuals his ship like an eating-house. But a seaman's rig and forty dollars is all you need, and with this you'll fare off to the American consuls, and swear that I've made life a burden to you. Why forty dollars? I asked. He winked. 
that's earnest money that when you reach the United States you'll have the law of me for ill usage. And what shall I get in exchange? You will get a certificate enabling you to pass from port as a discharged sailor seeking a ship. I thanked him warmly and agreed, climbed down the ship's side in my new rig, waved an affecting farewell to my benevolent tyrant, and sought the American consul, who, it seemed, was used to discontented seamen. At all events, he accepted without suspicion his share in the dishonouring comedy, took my forty dollars, and made out my certificate. Here the captain glanced at Dr. Gonsalves, who blinked. Said I, even a Protestant must sometimes understand the relief of confession. Armed with this, he went on, I made my way to the mouth of the Loire, to Saint-Nazaire, between which and Le Croissy lies a small island where, in the present weakness of the French marine, English ships of war are suffered to water unmolested. For ten Napoleons I bribed an old fisherman to row me out at night to this island, which we reached at daybreak, and to our dismay found the anchorage empty. We cast our nets, however, for a blind, and, taking a few fish on our way, worked slowly down to the southwest, where my comrade, and a faithful one he proved, had heard reports of an English frigate nosing about the coast. Sure enough, between breakfast and noon, we caught sight of her topmasts. But to reach her, we must pass in full view and almost within point-blank range of a coast battery. We were scarcely abreast of it when a round shot plumped into the sea ahead of us and brought us to, and almost at once a boatful of soldiers put off to board us. Their object, it turned out, was merely to warn us not to pass the battery, or the chances were five to one that the Englishmen would capture us. In no way discomposed, my friend maintained that we, he passed me off as his son, must either fish or starve, that we had come a long distance, knew every inch of the coast, and ran no danger. He backed this up by bribing the soldiers with our whole morning's catch, and in the end they contented themselves by insisting that we should wait under the battery until nightfall, and so depart. And this we did, but in the meanwhile, pretending our anxiety to avoid her, we cross-questioned the soldiers so precisely on the Englishman's bearings that, when darkness fell and we slipped our anchor, we ran straight down on her without the slightest difficulty. She was the agile sloop of twenty-four guns, and from her deck I waved goodbye to the fisherman, scarcely more delighted by my safety than he by his Napoleons, which, in my gratitude, I had raised to fifteen. The agile landed me in Plymouth without mishap, and so end my adventures. I ought to add, however, that, though my own conscience held no reproach for my trick upon Marmont, I sought and obtained permission from the war office to select a prisoner of my own rank and exchange him with France, and with him I sent a precise account, which will afford some amusement to the Duke of Ragusa's enemies, if he happen to have any at headquarters. You, my cousin, will doubtless consider this mere supererogation, but I should be glad of the Reverend Doctor's opinion. We will reserve this, said the doctor, as question number five. And you promptly reshipped for Lisbon, followed the army to Salamanca and resumed your work, said I. Even so, but I suspect that these adventures have rattled me. I am not the man I was, else I had not succumbed so easily to a mere coup de soleil. Will the Reverend Doctor complete the narrative by describing how he found me? In a ditch said the Reverend Doctor placidly. My college was destroyed, my beloved Salamanca in ruins. To the philosopher, said I, all the world is a home, but especially such wine vaults are as found in Boeda. I saddled therefore my mule, loaded her with a very few books and still fewer sticks of furniture, more frugal even than Juvenal's friend Umbricius. Qui tota domus redo componitur una, on my road, and almost under the shadow of this rock, my mule, shied in the most ladylike fashion, had sight of a red coat prostrate in the dust. The rest you can guess. But assuredly I did not guess at the time that I had happened on one whose story will, if ever God restores me to my university, so illustrate my lectures as to make them appear that which they will not be, an entirely new set of compositions. Well, said I, the hour is late, and however cheerfully you men of conscience and of casuistry may look forward to spending the night in these caves, I have seen enough, 
and have enough imagination at the back of it to desire nothing so little. I will escort you, said the doctor. That was implied, I answered, and after shaking hands with my kinsman and promising to visit him on the morrow, I suffered myself to be guided back along the horrible passages. On the way the doctor Gonsalveth paused more than once to chuckle, and at each remove I found this indulgence more uncanny. In the great cellar we came upon the sergeant of the thirty-sixth, still slumbering. I stirred him with my foot, and sitting up he amicably invited us to join him in a drink. I did so, the doctor drawing it from the spigot into a pail. Might be worse! Pick up to the sergeant watching me. I agreed that it might be a great deal worse. Between us we steered him out, through the tunnel, along the ledge, and so to the archway under which Venus sparkled in the purple heaven. Here the doctor bade us good night, and left me to pilot my drunkard down the cliff. At the foot he shook hands with me, in a fervour of tipsy gratitude, and I returned the grasp with an emprossement, a passion almost, the exact grounds of which, unless he should happen to read these lines and remember the circumstances, contingencies equally remote, he will spend his life without surmising. End of part two. End of the Sellers of Rueda. Section thirteen of the White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch. The Haunted Yacht. A Yarn. If anyone cares to buy the yawl siren, he may have her for two hundred pounds or a trifle less than the worth of her ballast as lead goes nowadays for sufficient reasons to be disclosed in the course of this narrative i am unable to give her builder's name and for reasons quite as sufficient i must admit the figures of her registered tonnage twenty nine point five six cut on the beam of her forecastle to be a fraud i will be perfectly frank there is a mystery about this yacht but i gave four hundred pounds for her in the early summer of eighteen ninety and thought her dirt cheap she was built under the old thames rule that is somewhere between eighteen seventy five and eighteen eighty and was therefore long and narrow to begin with she has been lengthened since nevertheless though nobody could call her a dry boat she will behave herself in any ordinary sea and come about quicker than most of her type she is fast, has sound timbers and sheathing that fits her like a skin, and her mainmast and bowsprit are particularly fine spars of Oregon pine. Her mizzen doesn't count for much. Let me mention the newest of patent capstans. I put this into her myself. Cabins panelled in teak and pitch pine and cushioned with red morocco. Two suits of sails besides a big spinnaker that does not belong to her present rig, a serviceable dinghy, well, you can see for yourselves without my saying more, that even to break up she's worth quite double the money. In what follows I shall take leave here and there to alter a name or suppress it. With these exceptions you shall hear precisely how the siren came into my hands. Early in 1890 I determined for the sake of my health to take a longer holiday than usual and spend the months of July, August, and September in a cruise about the Channel. My notion was to cross over to the French coast, sail down as far as Cherbourg, recross to Salcom, then sidle westward to Sicily, and finish up perhaps with a run over to Ireland. Now, this, I say, was my notion. You could not call it a plan, for it left me free to anchor in any port I chose, and to stay there just as long as it amused me. One fixed intention I had, and one only, to avoid the big regattas. Money had to be considered, and I thought at first of hiring. I wanted something between twenty-five and forty tons, small enough to be worked by myself and a crew of three, or at most three men and a boy and large enough to keep us occupied while at sea. Of course, I studied the advertisement columns, 
and for some time found nothing that seemed even likely to suit but at last in the field and in the left-hand bottom corner where it had been squeezed by the lists of the usual well-known agencies i came on the following yawl thirty-five tons for immediate sale that fast and comfortable cruiser siren lately refitted and now in perfect condition throughout rigging etc as good as new cabin appointments of unusual richness and taste four hundred pounds apply messrs dewey and moss agents and surveyors portside street f on reading this i took lloyd's yacht register from its shelf and hunted for further details sirens crowd pretty thickly in the register only a little less thickly than undines including sirenes and sirenas i found some fourteen and not a yawl amongst them nor anything of her tonnage there were two more in lloyd's list of american yachts one a centreboard schooner the other a centreboard sloop and in a further list i came upon a siren that had changed her name to mirage a screw schooner of one hundred and ninety tons owned by no less a person than the marquis of ormond on the whole it seemed pretty clear that lloyd knew not of the existence of this fast and comfortable cruiser of thirty-five tons however if half the promises of the advertisement were genuine chance ought not to be lost for lack of further inquiry so i sat down there and then and wrote a letter to the poetically named dewey and moss asking some questions in detail about the boat and in particular where she was to be seen the answer came by return of post the boat had been laid up since autumn in a sheltered creek of the f river about three-quarters of a mile up from the harbor side where messrs dewey and moss transacted business the keys lay at their office and she could be inspected at any time her sails gear and movable furniture were stored in a roomy loft at the back of messrs dewey and moss's own premises their client was a lady who wished to keep her name concealed at any rate during the preliminaries but they had full power to conduct the sale the yacht was a bargain the lady wished to be rid of it at once but they might mention that she would not take a penny less than the quoted price of four hundred pounds they would be happy to deal with me in that or any other line of business and they enclosed their card the card bore witness to the extraordinary versatility of messrs dewey and moss if to nothing else here is the digest of it auctioneers practical valuers house and estate agents business brokers ship brokers accountants and commission merchants servants registry office fire life accident and plate glass insurance affected fire claims repaired and adjusted livestock insured agents for gibson's non-slipping cycles agents for packington's manures the best and cheapest for all crops valuations for probate emigration agents private arrangements negotiated with creditors old violins cleaned and repaired vice consulate for norway and sweden i cannot say that this card produced quite the impression which its composers no doubt desired it seemed to me that messrs dewey and moss had altogether too many strings to their bow and the railway journey to f was a long one so i hesitated for two days and on the late afternoon of the third found myself some three hundred miles from home standing in a windy street full of the blown odors of shipping and pulling at a bell which sounded with terrifying alacrity just on the other side of the door a window was thrown up right above me and a head appeared of dewey as it turned out and invited me to come upstairs mr dewey met me on the landing introduced himself and led me into his office where a fat young woman sat awkwardly upon a wooden chair several inches too high for her hastily reviewing the many professional capacities in which mr dewey could serve her i decided that she must be a cook in search of a place the agent gave me the only other chair in the room 
it was clear that in their various feats of commercial dexterity the firm depended very little upon furniture and balanced himself on the edge of his knee-hole table he was a little round man and his feet dangled three inches from the floor he looked honest enough and spoke straightforwardly you have come about the yacht sir you would wish to inspect her at once oh, this is most unfortunate your letter only reached us this afternoon the fact is my partner mr moss has gone off for the day to n to attend the meeting of the amateur beekeepers association my partner is an enthusiast upon bee culture the versatility of moss began to grow bewildering and will not be back until late to-night as for me he consulted his watch i am due in half an hour's time to conduct the rehearsal of a service of song at the lady huntingdon's chapel down the street where i play the harmonium the diversity of dewey dazed me you are staying the night at f he said why well, yes i sleep at the ship inn but hope to leave early to-morrow of course you could inspect the sails and gear at once there in the loft behind he jerked a thumb over his shoulder so i understand but it would be better to see the boat first naturally naturally i hope you see how i am placed you would not desire me i feel sure to disappoint the chapel members who will be waiting presently for their rehearsal stay perhaps you would not greatly object to rowing up and inspecting the yacht by yourself here are the keys and my boat is at your disposal or if you prefer it a waterman nothing would suit me better if you don't mind my using the boat it will be a favor sir your using her i assure you this way if you please he jumped down from the table and led the way downstairs and through some very rickety back premises to the quay door where his boat lay moored to a frap as i climbed down and cast off mr dewey pulled out his watch again the evenings are lengthening and you'll have plenty of time half an hour to high water you will have the tide with you each way the keys will open everything on board and by the way you can't miss her black with a tarnished gilt line moored beside a large white schooner just three-quarters of a mile up you can tie up the boat to the frap on your return tomorrow will do for the keys at your service any time after nine a m good evening sir mr dewey turned and hurried back to his client whose presence during our interview he had completely ignored the sun had dropped behind the tall hills that lined the western shore of the beautiful f river but a soft yellow light too generously spread to dazzle suffused the whole sky and was reflected on the tide that stole up with scarcely a ripple a sharp bend of the stream brought me in sight of two yachts not fifty yards away their inverted reflections motionless as themselves i rested on my oars and drifted up towards them conning the black yawl carefully she struck me as too big for a thirty-five tonner foreshortened though she lay a wall-sided narrow boat but a very pretty specimen of her type her dismantled masts were painted white and her upper boards had been removed of course hello there was a man standing on her deck she lay with her nose pointed up the river and her stern towards me the man stood by her wheel for some idiotic reason best known to himself her builder had given her a wheel instead of a tiller which was covered up with tarpaulin he stood with a hand on this tarpaulin case and looked back over his shoulder towards me a tall fellow with a reddish beard and a clean-shaven upper lip i was drifting close by this time he looked curiously at me and i must have been studying his features for half a minute before i hailed him yacht ahoy i called out is that the siren getting no answer i pulled the boat close under the yacht's side made her fast and climbed on board by way of the channels this is the siren eh i said looking down her deck towards the wheel there was no man to be seen i stared around for a minute or so ran to the opposite side and looked over ran aft and leaned over her taffrail ran forward and peered over her bows her counter was too short to conceal a man and her stem had absolutely no overhang at all 
yet no man was to be seen nor boat nor sign of a man i tried the companion it was covered and padlocked the sail hatch and fore hatch were also fastened and padlocked and the skylights covered with tarpaulin and screwed firmly down a mouse could not have found its way below except perhaps by the stovepipe or the pipe leading down to the chain locker i was no believer in ghosts but i had to hit on some theory there and then my nerves had been out of order for a month or two and the long railway journey must have played havoc with them the whole thing was a hallucination so i told myself while pulling the coverings off the skylights but somehow got mighty little comfort out of it and i will not deny that i fumbled a bit with the padlock on the main hatchway or that i looked down a second time before setting foot on the companion ladder she was a sweet ship and the air below though stuffy had no taste of bilge in it i explored main cabin sleeping cabins forecastle the movable furniture had been taken ashore as i had been told but the fixtures were in good order the decorations in good taste not a panel had shrunk or warped nor could i find any leakage at the same time i could find no evidence that she had been visited lately by man or ghost the only thing that seemed queer was the inscription twenty nine point five six on the beam in the forecastle it certainly struck me that the surveyor must have under registered her but for the moment i thought little about it passing back through the main cabin i paused to examine one or two of the fittings particularly a neat glass-fronted bookcase with a small sideboard below it containing three drawers and a cellarette the bookcase was empty and clean swept so also were the drawers at the bottom of the cellarette i found a couple of flags stowed a tattered yellow quarantine signal tightly rolled into a bundle and a red ensign neatly folded as i lifted out the latter there dropped from its folds and fell upon the cabin floor a book i picked it up a thin quarto bound in black morocco and rather the worse for wear on its top side it bore the following inscription in dingy gilt letters jobs hotel penleven visitors book j job proprietor standing there beneath the skylight i turned its pages over wondering vaguely how the visitor's book of a small provincial hotel had found its way into that drawer it contained the usual assortment of conventional praise and vulgar jocosity mr and the honourable mrs smith of huddersfield cannot speak too highly of mrs jobs ham and eggs september fifteenth eighteen eighty one arrived wet through after a fifteen-mile tramp along the coast but thanks to mr and mrs job were soon steaming over a comfortable fire john and annie watson march eighteen eighty two note appended by a humorist then you sat on the hob i suppose there was the politely patronizing entry being accustomed to wolverhampton i am greatly pleased with this coast f b w the poetical effusion majestic spot say doth the sun in heaven behold aught to equal thee wave washed pen leaven etc lighter verse here i came to take my ease agreeably disappointed to find no fleas mrs job your bread and butter is quite too utterly utterly utter j harper june third eighteen eighty three the contemplative man's ejaculation it is impossible on viewing these cyclopean cliffs to repress the thought how great is nature how little man a note so it is old chap and a reproof in another hand shut up can't you see he's suffering the last entry was a brief one j mcguire liverpool september second eighteen eighty six twilight forced me to close the book and put it back in its place as i did so i glanced up involuntarily towards the skylight as if i half expected to find a pair of eyes staring down on me and yet the book contained nothing but these mere trivialities 
whatever my apprehension i was as j harper would have said agreeably disappointed i climbed on deck again relocked the hatch replaced the tarpaulins jumped into the boat and rowed homewards though the tide favored me it was dark before i reached mr dewey's quay door having with some difficulty found the frap i made the boat fast i groped my way across his back premises and out into the gaslit street and so to the ship in a fair dinner and a sound night's sleep at ten o'clock next morning i called on messrs dewey and moss again mr dewey received me and again he apologized for the absence of his partner who had caught an early train to attend a wrestling match at the far end of the county mr dewey showed me the sails gear cushions etc of the siren everything in surprising condition i told him that i meant business and added i suppose you have all the yacht's papers he stroked his chin bent his head to one side and asked shall you require them of course i said the transfer must be regular we must have her certificate of registry at the very least in that case i had better write and get them from my client is she not a resident here i don't know he said that i ought to tell you but i see no harm you are evidently sir a bona fide purchaser the lady's name is carlingford a widow residing at present in bristol this is annoying said i but if she lives anywhere near the temple mead station i might skip a train there and call on her she herself desired no delay and i desire it just as little but the papers are necessary after some little demure he gave me the address and we parted at the door i turned and asked by the way who was the fellow on board the siren last night as i rode up to her he gave me a stare of genuine surprise a man on board whoever he was he had no business there i make a point of looking after the yacht myself i hurried to the railway station soon after six that evening i knocked at mrs carlingford's lodgings in an unattractive street of bedminster that unattractive suburb a small maid opened the door took my card and showed me into a small sitting-room on the ground floor i looked about me a round table a horsehair couch a walnut sideboard with glass panels a lithograph of john wesley being rescued from the flames of his father's rectory a colored photograph as the door opened behind me and a woman entered i jumped back almost into her arms the colored photograph staring at me from the opposite wall above the mantel-shelf was a portrait a portrait of the man i had seen on board the siren who is that i demanded wheeling round without ceremony but if i was startled mrs carlingford seemed ready to drop with fright the little woman she was a very small shrinking creature with a pallid face and large nervous eyes put out a hand against the jamb of the door and gasped out why do you ask what do you want i beg your pardon i said it was merely curiosity i thought i had seen that face somewhere he was my husband he is dead then oh why do you ask yes he died abroad she touched her widow's cap with a shaking finger and then covered her face with her hands i was there i saw it why do you ask she repeated i beg your pardon sincerely i said it was only that the portrait reminded me of somebody but my business here is quite different i am come about the yacht siren which you have advertised for sale she seemed more than ever inclined to run her voice scarcely rose above a whisper my agents at f have full instructions about the sale yes but they tell me you have the papers i may say that i have seen the yacht and gear and am ready to pay the price you ask for immediate possession i said as much to mr dewey but the papers of course are they necessary certainly they are at least the certificate of registry or failing that some reference to the port of registry if the transfer is to be made i should also like to see her warrant if she has one and her sailmaker's certificate messrs dewey and moss could draw up the inventory she still hesitated at length she said 
I have the certificate. I will fetch it. The other papers, if she had any, have been lost or destroyed. She never had a warrant. I believe my husband belonged to no yacht club. I understand very little of these matters. She left the room and returned in five minutes or so with the open document in her hand. But, said I, looking over it, this is a certificate of a vessel called the Wasp. Ah, I must explain that. I wish the boat to change her name with a new owner. Her old name, it has associations, painful ones. I should not like anyone else to know her as the Wasp. Well, I admit it, I can understand that. But see here, she is entered as having one mast and carrying a cutter rig. She was a cutter originally. My husband had her lengthened in 1886, I think by five feet, and turned her into a yawl. It was abroad at Malaga. A curious port to choose. She was built, you see, as long ago as 1875. My husband used to say she was a broad boat for those days and could be lengthened successfully and turned into quite a new-looking vessel. He gave her an entirely new sheathing, too, and all her spars are new. She was not insured, and being in a foreign port, it was understood he would have her newly registered when he returned, which he fully intended. So no alterations were made in the certificate here, and I believe her old tonnage is still carved up somewhere inside her. This was true enough. The figures on the certificate, 29.56, were those I had seen on the beam in the forecastle. My husband never lived to reach England, and when she came back to F, though she was visited, of course, by the customs house officer and coast guard, nobody asked for her certificate, and so the alterations in her were never explained. She was laid up at once in the F River, and there she has remained. Certain structural peculiarities in the main cabin, scarcely noted at the time, but now remembered, served to confirm Mrs. Carlingford's plainly told story. On my return to London that night I hunted up some back volumes of Hunt, and satisfied myself on the matter of the Wasp and her owner, William Carlingford. And to be short, the transfer was made on a fresh survey, the check sent to Mrs. Carlingford, and the old siren passed into my hands. All being settled, I wrote to my old acquaintance, Mr. Dewey, asked him to fit the vessel out and find me a steady skipper and crew, not without some apprehension of hearing by return of post that Dewey and Moss were ready and willing to sign articles with me to steer and sail the yacht in their spare moments. Perhaps the idea did not occur to them. At any rate, they found me a crew and a good one and I spent a very comfortable three months cruising along the southwestern coast, across to Scilly, from Scilly to Cork, and back to Southampton, where on September 29th, 1891, I laid the yacht up for the winter. Thrice since have I applied to Messrs. Dewey and Moss for a crew, and always with satisfactory results. But I must pass over 1892 and 1893, and come to the summer of 1894, or, to be precise, to Wednesday the 11th of July. We had left Plymouth that morning for a run westward, but the wind falling light towards noon, we found ourselves drifting or doing little more off the entrance of the small fishing haven of Penleven. Though I had never visited Penleven, I knew on the evidence of many picture shows that the place was well worth seeing. Besides, had I not the assurances of the visitor's book in my cabin? It occurred to me that I would anchor for an hour or two in the entrance of the haven, and eat my lunch ashore at Mr. Job's hotel. Mr. Job would doubtless be pleased to recover his long-lost volume, and I had no more wish than right to retain it. Job's hotel was unpretending. Mrs. Job offered me ham and eggs, and, as an alternative, a cut-off of broiled silver side of beef, if I did not mind waiting for ten minutes or so, while her husband would be back to dinner. I said that I would wait, and added that I should be pleased to make Mr. Job's acquaintance on his return, as I had a trifling message for him. About ten minutes later, while studying a series of German lithographs in the coffee-room, I heard a heavy footstep in the passage, and a knock at the door, 
and mr job appeared a giant of a man with a giant's girth and red cheeks which he sufflated as a preliminary of speech good day mr job said i i won't keep you from your dinner but the fact is i am the unwilling guardian of a trifle belonging to you and i showed him the visitor's book i thought the man would have had an apoplectic fit there on the spot he rolled his eyes dropped heavily upon a chair and began to breathe hard and short where where he gasped and began to struggle again for breath i said for some reason or other the sight of this book distresses you and i think you'd better not try to speak for a bit i will tell you exactly how the book came into my possession and afterwards you can let me have your side of the story if you choose and i told him just what i have told the reader at the conclusion mr job loosed his neckcloth and spoke that book sir ought to be lying at the bottom of the sea it was lost on the evening of september the third eighteen eighty six on board a yacht that went down with all hands and now i'll tell you all about it there was a gentleman called blake staying over at port william that summer that's four miles up the coast you know i nodded staying with his wife and one son a tall young fellow aged about twenty-one maybe they came from liverpool and they had a yacht with them that they kept in port william harbour anchored just below the bridge she would be about thirty tons a very pretty boat they had only one hired hand for crew used to work her themselves for the most part the lady was extraordinary clever at the helm or at the sheets either very quiet people they were you might see them most days that summer anchored out on the whiting grounds what was she called the queen of sheba cut her rig quite a new boat it was said afterwards that the owner mr blake designed her himself she used often to drop anchor off penleven know her why of course i'd know her specially considering what happened what was that a very sad case it made a lot of talk at the time one day it was the third of september eighty six mr and mrs blake and the son they anchored off the haven and came up here to tea i supposed at the time that they'd left their paid hand robertson on board but it turned out he was left home at port william that day barking a small mainsail that mr blake had brought a purpose for the fishing well mrs blake's your tea and while my missus was layin' the cloth young mr blake he picks up that very book sir that was lyin' on the sideboard and begins readin it and laughin my wife she goes out of the room for to cut the bread and butter and when she comes back there was the two gentlemen by the window studyin the book with their backs to the room and mrs blake lying back in the chair i'm now sittin on and her face turned to the wall so the young mr blake he turns round and says this here's a very amusin book mrs job would you mind my borrowin it for a day or two to copy out some of the poetry i'll bring it back next time we put into penleven of course my wife says no she didn't mind then the elder mr blake he says i see you had a visitor here yesterday a uh, mr mcguire is he in the house my wife said no the gentleman has left his traps but he'd started that morning to walk to port william to spend the day nothing more passed they had their tea and paid for it and went off to their yacht i saw that book in the young man's hand as he went down the passage well sir it was just duskin in as they weighed and stood up toward port william the wind blowing pretty steady from the southard at about ten minutes to seven o'clock it blew up in a sudden little squall nothing to mention the fishing boats just noticed it and that was all but it was reckoned that squall capsized the queen of sheba she never reached port william and no man ever clapped eyes on her after twenty minutes past six when dick crego declared he saw her off the bluff halfway towards home and going steady under all canvas the affair caused a lot of stir here and at port william and in the newspapers short-handed as they were of course they'd no business to carry on as they did specially as my wife declares from her looks that mrs blake was feeling faint afore they started she always seemed to me a weak timorsome woman at the best small and ailin to look at and mr blake oh he was a strong made gentleman tall and a big red beard the son took after his father only he hadn't any beard a fine upstanding pair and no trace was ever found of them not a stick nor a shred 
but about the visitor's book you'll swear they took it with them see there's not a stain of salt water upon it no there isn't but i'll swear young blake had it in his hand as he went from my door i said mr job i've kept you already too long from your dinner go and eat and ask them to send in something for me afterwards i want you to come with me and take a look at my yacht it's lying just outside the haven as we started from the shore mr job casting his eyes over the siren remarked that's a very pretty yawl of yours sir as we drew nearer he began to eye her uneasily she's been lengthened some five or six feet i said she was a cutter to begin with lord help us then mr job in a hoarse whisper she's the queen of sheba i'd swear to her run anywhere i or to that queer angle of her horse holes a close examination confirmed mr job that my yacht was no other than the lost queen of sheba lengthened and altered in rig it persuaded me too i turned back to plymouth and leaving the boat in catwater drove to the millbay station and took a ticket for bristol arriving there just twenty-four hours after my interview with mr job i made my way to mrs carling ford's lodging she had left them two years before nothing was known of her whereabouts the landlady could not even tell me whether she had moved from bedminster and so i had to let the matter rest but just fourteen days ago i received the following letter dated from a workhouse in one of the midland counties dear sir i am a dying woman and shall probably be dead before this reaches you the doctor says he cannot give me forty-eight hours it is angina pectoris and i suffer horribly at times the yacht you purchased of me is not the wasp but the queen of sheba my husband designed her he was a man of some property near limerick and he and my son were involved in some of the irish troubles between eighteen eighty one and eighteen eighty four it was said they had joined one of the brotherhoods and betrayed their oaths this i am sure was not true but it is certain we had to run for fear of assassination after a year in liverpool we were forced to fly south to port william where we brought the yacht and lived for some time in quiet under our own names but we knew this could not last and had taken measures to escape when need arose my husband had chanced while at liverpool upon an old yacht dismantled and rotting in the mercy but of about the same size as his own and still of course upon the register he bought her of her owner a mr carlingford and a stranger for a very few pounds and with her what he valued far more her papers but he never completed the transfer at the custom house his plan was if pressed to escape abroad and pass his yacht off as the wasp and himself as mr carlingford all the while we lived at port william the queen of sheba was kept amply provisioned for a voyage of at least three weeks when the necessity overtook us quite suddenly the name of a man maguire in the visitor's book of a small inn at penleven we left penleven at dusk that evening and held steadily up the coast until darkness and then we turned the yacht's head and ran straight across for morlax but the weather continuing fine for a good fortnight our first night at sea was the roughest in all this time we changed our minds cleared ushant and held right across for vigo thence after revictualling we cruised slowly down the coast and through the straits finally reaching malaga there we stayed and had the yacht lengthened my husband had sold his small property before ever we came to port william and had managed to invest the whole under the name of carlingford there was no difficulty about letters of credit at each port along the way we had shown the wasp papers and used the name of carlingford and at lisbon we read in an english newspaper about the supposed capsizing of the queen of sheba still we had only to persuade the officials at various ports that our boat was the wasp we knew that our enemies were harder to delude and our next step was to make her as unlike the wasp or the queen of sheba as possible this we did by lengthening her and altering her rig but it proved useless as i had always feared it would the day after we sailed from malaga a spanish-speaking seaman 
whom we had hired there as an extra hand, came aft, as if to speak to my husband, who stood at the wheel, and halting a pace or two from him, lifted a revolver, called him by name, and shot him dead. Before he could turn, my son had knocked him senseless, and in another minute had tumbled him overboard. We buried my husband in the sea next day. We held on, we two alone, past Gibraltar, I steering and my son handling all the sails, and ran up for Cadiz. There we made deposition of our losses, inventing a story to account for them, and my son took the train for Paris, for we knew that our enemies had tracked the yacht, and there would be no escape for him if he clung to her. I waited for six days, and then engaged a crew and worked the yacht back to F. I have never since set eyes on my son, but he is alive, and his hiding is known to myself and to one man only, a member of the Brotherhood, who surprised the secret. To keep that man silent, I spent all my remaining money. To quiet him, I had to sell the yacht, and now that money too is gone, and I am dying in a workhouse. God help my son now. I deceived you, and yet I think I did you no great wrong. The yacht I sold you was my own, and she was worth the money. The figures on the beam were cut there by my husband before we reached Vigo to make the yacht correspond with the wasp certificate. If I have wronged you, I implore your pardon. Yours truly, Catherine Blake. Well, that is the end of the story. It does not, I am aware, quite account for the figure I saw standing by the siren's wheel. As for the wasp, she has long since rotted to pieces on the waters of the Mercy. But the question is, have I a right to sell the siren? I certainly have a right to keep her, for she is mine, sold to me in due form by her rightful owner, and honestly paid for. But then, I really don't want to keep her. P. End of section 13